My name is Lorna Thorpe. I am a professor of epidemiology at the NYU School of Medicine in the Department of Population Health, the same department where Professor Duncan uh, is a faculty member as well. And so I have the real pleasure of introducing Dustin to the group and then moderating our discussion with him. And I hope that there's lots of questions from, from everyone. Um, and we're really here to celebrate this book. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dustin. He is an associate professor in the Department of Population Health at NYU Langone. And he also directs the NYU, uh, NYU's Spatial Epidemiology Laboratory there. And just to give you a sense of how much in demand he is, he's in the Department of Population Health, but he also, everybody wants a piece of him. <laughs> he's also a faculty affiliate at the NYU uh, Abu Dhabi campus, and that's why we're here today. Um, also the College of Global Public Health, uh, the Population Center, the Center for Data Science, the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies, and uh, there's more, <laughs> the Center for Drug Use and HIV Research. And that's just really, I think, in many ways, reflects just exactly who uh, Dustin is, uh, a really collaborative and productive uh, researcher. He's a social and spatial epidemiologist, and his research broadly seeks to understand how social and contextual factors, especially neighborhood uh, characteristics, influence population health and also health disparities. Uh, he has a particular focus on HIV epidemiology and an emerging work on sleep epidemiology. He has another theme that cross-sects this, which is an emphasis on minority health and health disparities. Uh, especially among sexually minority populations, and in particular, gay, bisexual, uh, and other men who have sex with men. Methodologically, uh, he uses a geospatial lens to his work to uh, 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 employ uh, GIS, uh, uh, web-based geospatial technologies, real-time geospatial technologies, and a whole host of modeling uh, techniques uh, to his research. And with that approach and that focus, he has published more than 100 publications in peer review research and book chapters. Uh, his research has appeared in major media outlets. Uh, he's a prolific and successful grant writer. Uh, he's funded uh, by NIH, CDC, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, Verizon and Aetna Foundations, HIV Prevention Trials Network, and that's, I think, naming just a few. Uh, he completed his doctorate and postdoctoral fellowship, both in social epidemiology at Harvard University, School of Public Health. And today, we're here to really learn about the forthcoming co-edited book, uh, Neighborhoods and Health, which is in its second edition, um, which he co-edited with Ichiro Kawashi, who is uh, really, in many ways, the uh, a real grandfather of social epidemiology in our country. And this most recent edition provides us with an up-to-date overview of neighborhood health research uh, being conducted in the fields of epidemiology, but also in the field of geography. And it gives us the latest science, but if you've had a chance to see it, I don't, people haven't had a chance to see it, no. Okay, well, when you see it, um, and when you buy it, most importantly, you'll see that it, it really is giving us an overview of the latest science, but also in a really accessible way. Um, so I want to congratulate you and Ichiro. I know how much work this is. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work. And so um, what, what we'll do is we'll have Dustin uh, tell us a little bit about the book. And then uh, we'll have a moderated discussion. I have some questions for him. I'll start, but I would really love to hear from, from the audience as well. And we will take it from there. So welcome, Dustin. All right, so tonight's event is called Neighbors in Health, a progress report. Again, as Lorna said, it's going to be divided into three chunks. The first chunk is going to be a lecture by me, including some selected readings from the text. Um, the second chunk, which I hope to be kind of engaging, where, whereby we're going to have a discussion led by Lorna, um, and uh, moderated by Lorna, but you guys are going to be uh, engaging in that. And then finally, we're going to have a reception downstairs where you can we can take this discussion further a little bit more informally, and also you can. So uh, before I begin, I just want to provide a lot of thanks, but I'm going to provide two major thanks immediately. The first thanks is to NYU Abu Dhabi for giving us this space and for also providing the resources for the reception, et cetera. 
And then uh, you may not know, but Lauren is a, a preeminent epidemiologist here in New York City, and so it's a real honor for her to introduce me, but also to moderate tonight's discussion. She's not only a professor of epidemiology in our department, she's also a director of the Division of Epidemiology and also a vice chair of strategy and planning in the Department of Population Health. But also importantly, she was the, for five years, she served as the Deputy Commissioner of Epidemiology for New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And so she's really someone who's entrenched in studying neighbors within New York City. So the actual talk is broken up into four chunks. The first chunk is neighbors and spatial epidemiology. I'm going to convince you that studying neighborhoods is actually important. And I'm going to tell you how neighborhoods actually can be important to study um, in terms of health. The second chunk is the second half, the first half of the book, which talks about how we actually measure neighborhood characteristics. There's a wide variety of approaches, some of which you've heard of, some of which you may not have heard of. First, I'll talk about qualitative methods such as go long interviews. Some of my students have heard this before, sorry. Um, then, I'm going to talk about quantitative methods, including new emerging methods like using social media to, to study neighborhoods. The second half of the book is substantive features looking, connecting neighbors and health outcomes. So, first, I'll talk about neighborhood built environment, not defined through you, and how they relate to health. But then I'll talk about neighborhood social environments and how they relate to health. And then finally, I'll talk about current trends, some of my research, and implications of this stuff for all of me. So why this even matters in the first place. So before talking about neighbors and spatial epidemiology, I would like to read to you the foreword of the preface. The preface was written by um, Anna diaz Ru, who is an epidemiologist. She's also a professor and dean of Drexel University School of Public Health. I'll read to you the first paragraph. 20 years ago, when the study of contextual effects was just emerging as a distinct area of empirical inquiry in public health, I found myself explaining why on earth would someone be interested in ecological variables when trying to explain causes of diseases in individuals. This proved to be a good exercise. It forced us to clearly articulate why and how context could be, might be important, and more generally, why multi-level thinking, not just multi-level analysis, was critical not only to fully understand causation, but also to identify promising, pro promising policies to improve health. Fortunately, the argument had a strong conceptual basis, was supported by sociological research, and resonated with practitioners, including physicians, who saw the embodied impact of context in their patient every day. It made total sense. A variety of contexts could directly affect proximal level related health determinants behaviors and biological processes, like the stress response, or could interact with individual characteristics to affect health. But, of, of course, demonstrating this empirically was no easy task. And then most importantly, what can we do about it? So first I want to talk about neighborhoods and spatial epidemiology. So you've heard or maybe seen neighborhood reports in the news. So this is a a uh, title from CNN, Neighbors with More Light Have Been Linked to Higher Breast Cancer Risks. Um, this is a slide that one of my RAs hold, but uh, uh, deprived areas found to have worse health, life expectancy, and health outcomes. Another newspaper clipping says, life in poor neighborhoods is hard on the heart. So what is Neighbors in Health or summarized as spatial epidemiology? It's essentially the study of the spatial distribution and the spatial determinants of health within human populations. And when we think about neighborhoods, the first thing we do is define a neighborhood. One of the first ways we define neighborhoods, oh sorry. So this is a quote from George Glaser, who talks about the difficulty defining neighborhoods. And he says the following. Urban social scientists have treated neighborhood in much the same way as courts have treated pornography. A term that's hard to define precisely, but everyone knows it when they see it. So in the book, we define neighborhoods as geographical places that have social and cultural meanings alike to residents and non-residents alike, and are subdivisions of larger, larger spaces, for example, cities, counties, etc. There are multiple ways to define neighborhoods. And the first way to define neighborhoods is based on someone's perception of a neighborhood. So this is a paper conducted by some colleagues at Columbia University. And I asked the, a sample of gay, bisexual, and other men with men the following question. When you think of your home neighborhood, what area do you usually think of? The area of the block you live on, the area within five blocks from the place you live, the area within 10 blocks from the place you live, or area larger than 10 blocks from the place you live. So I'm going to treat this like a classroom, if you, if you will. Who thinks the participant said the area you live, the block uh, you live on A? 
Raise your hand if you believe that. Okay. B, the area within five blocks from the place of birth. Scott, Frank, my mom. C, the area within 10 blocks from the place you live. Okay. And D, the area larger than 10 blocks from the place you live. So you're all wrong. <laughs> so essentially what they found is there was no consistency in how people determined how they defined the neighborhoods. In fact, there was significant, uh, there, it, within each class, there was a, a significant amount of people who defined the neighborhoods in a different four ways. Perhaps what's most interesting is that even people who are in the same neighborhood conceptualized or thought about the neighborhoods as different. And this is a map from that paper. This is just an example of a website called Bostonography, and I use Boston as an example because I've lived in Boston for so long and I've studied Boston for a long time. But this is an example from Bostonography, which is a company within Boston, and they did this crowdsourced method where they asked people how they define, how they define neighborhoods. And this is the neighborhood I formerly lived in, Back Bay, and you can see that on the outside of that neighborhood, there's large disagreement in terms of how people conceptualize or whether they agree if that was an actual neighborhood. So there are many objective ways to define neighborhoods, including using administrative data like zip codes. Um, what's currently used to define neighborhoods is GIS. So we create a buffer on a particular location. You can think about this space as a location, and we define a neighborhood as a buffer around this uh, one mile radius around this particular location. And the method that my group specializes in is using GPS devices to define what's called as activity spaces. So my group essentially goes out and gives people, participants, this dedicated GPS device, and they wear it for different durations, two weeks usually in our protocols. And from this GIS data, we can actually track traces of where people go, and then we can find neighborhoods around those locations. Essentially, this approach is really important for many reasons, but one methodological limitation that it addresses is something called the residential trap. And essentially, the vast majority of research, including uh, this review conducted by a colleague of mine in, in Paris, found that about 85% of studies that look at neighbors and health focus on just the residential environment. And as I'm about to show you, as you can imagine, other contexts matter to people's health and well-being. The other thing that this addresses is this idea of spatial polygamy. Unfortunately, I didn't create the term. I just stole it. But this term essentially was uh, developed by John Owen, who was a geographer from Indiana University. And he essentially said that, uh, that people, where people live matters for one's health, of course. But we're also where people go to school and work, where people play and socialize, and where people do errands and shop. And the kind of other perhaps profound thing that he articulated is that not, not just these distinct locations that matter for our health and well-being, but it's the connections between these places or the pathway. So I'm just going to prevent some evidence on spatial polygamy to demonstrate to you that this probably exists. So we did a study a couple of years ago where we sampled a group of young men and women here in New York City. And we asked them three things. Pretty simple. Where do you live? Where do you socialize? And where do you have sex? And essentially, because the data was uh, uh, collected in a, a very crude way where people answered in very different ways, so some people said their borough, some people said neighborhood names like Chelsea, some people said specific uh, addresses, we, did, we aggregated everything up to the borough level. And what we found is that 75% of participants in our study did not socialize, live, and have sex in the same neighborhoods. Put differently, that they were highly spatially polygamous. So in preparing for our grant um, uh, uh, protocol, I was a participant in the study, in my own study. And essentially what we did is we wanted to look at mobility patterns to test the protocol. But I want to demonstrate patient polygamy with some of my real data. So at the time, I lived on 29th and 3rd, and I worked on 3rd, and I still currently work on 30th and 3rd. And so you see there's high concordance in terms of my work and my home neighborhoods. What I wore, did was I wore a GPS device for two periods, for two weeks. I wore it in the fall, in the end of the summer, and the beginning of the fall. This is my data from the first wave of wearing my GPS device, um, the raw data, and this is the density. So the, 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 the greater the orange is, the more time I spent in these places. It's not perhaps surprising that I spent a lot of time in my home and work neighborhoods, but I also spent significant time here in the West Village, maybe because I see a lot of my friends who are professor at Columbia, we kind of meet there. I spent a lot of time here in the village. My partner used to live here at Fort Greene, so I spent time here in these other locations. So this is the data uh, two weeks from the fall, uh, so the second wave of data. 
and it was the, in fall, so I didn't go anywhere near here, but I spent a lot of time in these various neighborhoods within New York City. So why study neighborhoods in the first place? So this is a quote from George Kaplan, who's a noted social epidemiologist, and he said the following. Like real estate, help with location, location, location. Where you live makes an enormous difference in terms of the air you breathe, the schools you go to, the work, transportation, housing, streets, violence levels, et cetera, et cetera, that you live with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we talked about that, you know, within spatial epidemiology or neighbors in health that it's new and that uh, there are recent clippings talking about how neighbors can relate to breast cancer, et cetera. What, what misses is that this is not a new field. In fact, this field has been existing for a long time. So this is Louis René Villemer, who we talked about in the first chapter, who was a noted French physician and uh, statistician. What he did was he linked neighborhood poverty to mortality in the 1830s within Paris. <coughs> this is John Snow, who is who some consider to be the father of spatial epidemiology. And essentially what he did was he discovered um, the determinants of cholera in 1854 and he did, uh, in the Soho neighborhood of London. And essentially what he did, as described in the book, he made this dot map of all the cholera cases and he determined that what was the cause of cholera was this Broad Street pump. Does someone want to say why that's actually interesting? Before I say. <laughs> Say that again? They got water from drinking water. Okay, so that was the reason why they got cholera, yes. My student, Hayden, is on. Why is this important? And actually, this is really critical what he did. Today, it doesn't seem interesting, but it's actually fascinating. Because if you know, you can change it. Sure, and you're going to say Nancy's point. <laughs> That's right, go ahead. Uh, um, one point would be that they hadn't identified the cholera pathogen yet. That's exactly right. So as Justin is saying, as a professor in the department, is that no, the way we conceptualize disease in the 1830s or the 1850s was uh, miasma. So we conceptualize disease as literally being caused by bad air. But we're here, here we're actually demonstrating or documenting that it's not the bad air that's causing these diseases, it's actually this environmental feature. And we talk about that in the important of the book. So these are just some, some uh, uh, current papers, including a paper by one of my former postdocs, that's used this method of spatial clustering to identify uh, clusters of disease. And there's another paper about spatial clustering of HIV. So why neighborhoods? This is a, a, a picture taken from the New York Times a couple years ago that showed that geography matters, especially for poor people. So this is a map of a subway line here in New York City. And it shows each of the subway lines, uh, the number six by the premature death rate. You see that the, in lower Manhattan, we have, if you live there, you have a lower uh, premature death rate. But the higher up you go, including in Harlem and the Bronx, the more premature death there is. Why could that be? So a couple years ago, my group with a colleague and friend of mine, Mike Mangani, created a documentary called Bad Neighbors Affects Health, question mark, the story of low income housing residents. And this is one person who participated in our documentary. And she said, literally, it's a her word, not ours, they don't care about us in the hood. And what she was saying is that in her neighborhood, in the hood as she described it, there was no opportunities for healthy eating. So there's a wide range of neighborhood characteristics that can influence health. And generally, we just aggregate them into two buckets. One, the built environment. And two, the social environment. The built environment includes things like walkable destinations, retail stores and parks and community design features. For example, sidewalk quality. The social environment also includes a wide range of neighborhood characteristics. Things like neighborhood safety, neighborhood norms, stigma from living in certain neighborhoods. So originally, when in the 1800s, when these studies of spatial epidemiology were developing, the studies actually weren't developed to study neighborhood health. They kind of used these existing databases. But I want to say that to, to just give you a sense that now we're designing studies specifically to study neighbors and health. So you can imagine that the questions that we can ask are a lot richer and our, our, our results are a lot more nuanced. So here's a study that I work with called the, neighbor, the Residential Environment in Coronary Heart Disease Court Study. And it's a court study by a close colleague of mine, Mazil Shea in Paris. And this study has two waves. The first wave, we had over 7,000 adults. We're collecting data um, from these adults who were visiting health centers. And the second wave, we had uh, just over 6,000 participants. This is the well-known Los Angeles Family and Neighborhood Health Survey. They similarly had two waves. 
and they had over 3,000 households with, uh, who were nested in 65 census tracts. This is a project for human development in Chicago neighborhoods, which is a well-known study um, from the University of Chicago, which had over 6,000 kids nested within 80 neighborhood clusters. And finally, this is a study that my group conducted a couple summers ago, where we collected data from 120 low-income housing residents. We collected survey data, GPS data, et cetera. So now I'm going to talk about ways we can measure neighborhoods within spatial epidemiology. I'll first talk about qualitative methods and quantitative methods. The qualitative methods chapter was led by a close colleague of mine, Donna Keene, who's a professor at Yale. So qualitative methods are traditional in social science research, especially marketing research, and they ask the, the why and the how. We're not really as much interested in, in the what, the where, and the when. In qualitative research, we really focus on smaller samples, and they tend to be more focused than uh, larger samples. And there's a wide range of characteristics of qualitative research, which are there, it's in the slides. But one hallmark, or unusual hallmark, is that it tends to take place in the natural environment, and it also the researcher views the social phenomena a little bit more holistically. So one first method for conducting qualitative research in neighbors and health is using focus groups. So a group of people come together, and they tell us about their opinions about something. The next method is we conduct interviews. And we conduct one-on-one -on -one individuals, so two people or more, um, where the interview tries to elicit facts. I put up Wendy Williams there for a silly example, but in my class in NYU Abu Dhabi, we actually demonstrate that she's really good at eliciting information that people don't necessarily want to say. I also saw her yesterday, so that's why I put it there. A, a method you may be more familiar with is ethnographic research, which is really commonly used in sociology. And the observer goes in the field and essentially observes people, and the data is the notes that the participant take. A method that we highlight in the book that's especially salient to studying neighbors and health is what's called go-along interviews. And it's kind of this hybrid approach between ethnographic research and interviews. And so essentially, the participants take um, the interviewer through walkthroughs where they were able to contextualize their lived experiences within time and space. So I want to provide one example of qualitative research, which was uh, by a, a paper conducted by a medical student of mine who's now finishing her, doing her residency. And it's titled, Neighbor Perceptions and Hypertension Among Low-Income Black Women, a Qualitative Study. So I really present the, aim, the, the second aim of the paper which was to identify neighborhood level risk factors for hypertension among this sample of low-income black women. So I told you a little bit about this NYC low-income housing neighborhoods and health study, which we recruited again 120 public housing residents. So from this sample, she drew 17 black women, and the characteristics of them are described there. So what the medical students of mine did was they measured the participants' height, weight, and blood pressure. We had interviews, they were semi-structured, so we had questions, but they were, they were somewhat malleable in terms of uh, uh, probing. And they lasted about 70, uh, sorry, 30 minutes, and we asked a variety of questions. One question was, can you describe food options available to you and others in your neighborhood? The interviews were subsequently transcribed and coded. So there are several themes that came out of the data, and so I'll share a couple of them and read a couple quotes. The first theme is social connectedness, and the second theme is stress. I'll read to this quote from participant 10, the pre-hypertensive participant. She says, I don't like it over, over there. For me, I don't care that it's the project that we're living in. Don't put your garbage in front of the dumpster. Put, your, dump, put, put it in the dumpster, dodo brain. Don't throw it in the garbage. Don't throw your garbage in front of the building. Throw it in the trash bin. We walk to the supermarket at like 2 in the morning, and all these rats, he should have seen them. The, second, the third theme was food option. So this participant 17, who was hypertensive, said the following. You know, you feel like because it's a low-income community that they bring the worst of everything there. So you actually have to go outside of your community to get things that you feel are nutritious for your body. So now I'm going to talk about quantitative methods, which is a chapter that I wrote with a former student of mine who's doing his PhD at, uh, at Brown, and a colleague of mine, Richard Nara, who's a professor of engineering here. So there's a wide range of methods we can do to study uh, uh, neighborhoods via quantitative means. One of the first and perhaps easiest approaches is simply giving someone a survey. I'll just give you a quick example. 
The last paper that was published of my, from my group was a paper um, by one of my former undergraduate students that looked at neighbor safety and mental health among gay men in Paris. So what do we do? We sample this, this sample of gay men via this application, a, a geosocial network and a hookup application, and we essentially gave them this survey over this, this web-based survey over the application. And we found, perhaps not surprisingly, that those who report living in neighbors as unsafe had symptoms of anxiety, depression, and psychological distress. There's a wide variety of other methods I'm about to explain, but I'm really going to talk about the more interesting and innovative things, including some of the things that my group does. So one method is using real-time geospatial data, things like cameras, sense cam, et cetera, which are cameras that can go around your neck or brooches. And so this is a picture of a sense cam and the things that it can take. So at the time, the leading group that was studying this camera, perhaps this is a little silly, was this group from Oxford. So I really wanted to learn about the camera. So I studied there as a visiting fellow for a couple months. So my advisor essentially made me wear this camera to understand what it's like to wear the camera. But this is me riding my bike from my flat in Oxford to my, my uh, office in Hennington. And so this group and others have shown that sense cam can be used to measure certain things about neighbors, including the built environment. Things like trees and cars parking. Also, one, there are other cameras available, including Google, Cla Google Glasses. So my first year, in fact, I bought them, or actually I had NYU with them, um, and I essentially returned them, so they were very expensive. But there's a wide variety of other cameras that one could use to study neighborhoods. And so this is a camera pivot head from uh, extreme sports that researchers are, are beginning to use to study neighborhoods of health. Crowdsourcing is another method that we can use to study neighborhoods. Of course, crowdsourcing is obtaining uh, information from a large amount of group of people, and usually via an on online system. There's a wide range of, of uh, platforms for crowdsourcing, including Yelp, WalkScore, etc. So Yelp can be used to study things about neighbors, including the food environment. This is one paper led by Scott Sherman in the audience, who tracks hookah uh, outlets um, using Yelp. And essentially, uh, what they did was they wanted to see whether we could, whether they could use Yelp track hookah bars, and then the more substantive question was whether there was an increase in hookah bars over time. And so they proved their point that one, you could use hookah, Yelp to measure hookah bars, and then secondly, there was a substantial increase in hookah bars from that time period, uh, uh, 2009 to 2012 slash 2014. And so this is some work by Tom Kirshner, who, where they've taken cameras um, uh, 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 to study things about neighborhoods, and you could put these images into systems for people to measure online. So if it's a system, uh, Amazon Turk, and essentially people get paid uh, cents or pennies on the, uh, to uh, assess certain things about these images. So you can look at you know, whether there's cracks in the sidewalk or, or the curate aspects of sidewalks, as an, exact, as an example. And the final method is using information retrieval. Um, so obtaining information from existing data sets, usually social media. So Twitter, Instagram, etc. This is a paper conducted by a grad school colleague of mine, David Shea, where he wanted to measure neighborhood racism. So what did he do? He basically quantified the number of Google searches for the N-word and put them into neighborhoods, which, and, and of course, the Google search for the N-word were geolocated. And essentially, he then linked this neighborhood characteristic neighborhood level racism to a health outcome, in this case, mortality among black individuals. And he found, perhaps not surprisingly, that neighbor, uh, black individuals who lived in neighborhoods with higher uh, area level racism, again, as defined by Google searches for the N-word, had higher mortality. And he subsequently followed up this with several other papers, demonstrating that this uh, area level racism measure is quite predictive. <clears throat> Many colleagues are starting to use Instagram to study neighborhoods, including us. So we have a project that we're just finishing where we're studying, or we're using Instagram to study neighborhoods with uh, Rui Chinara. So what we're doing is we, uh, we focus on the concept of Abu Dhabi for several reasons, and we really talk about it in the chapter really deeply. But one reason is um, there's a ubiquity of healthy and especially unhealthy food options. And there's this, uh, in Abu Dhabi in particular, uh, in the UAE, excuse me, they have the highest prevalence of diabetes in the world, and we're not quite sure why. Also, it's quite culturally relevant. In the UAE, we are, you're, you're, you're not supposed to take pictures of uh, UAE nationals, uh, especially women. Um, so people tend to take pictures of the external features, like their environments. 
And this is a paper by a colleague of mine who used Twitter to characterize neighborhood features. And essentially they used, uh, they coded tweets <laughs> as pertaining to happiness, pertaining to physical activity, and pertaining to healthy eating. And what they did was they aggregated all these tweets up to the state level. So for example, New York State. And they found that greater happiness, uh, positivity towards physical activity, and positivity towards healthy food options, or healthy food, excuse me, was associated with lower cost mortality and a, a lower prevalence of chronic conditions such as obesity. I don't buy this one final example of a project that Rumi and I and others recently completed um, from, the, from the National Institute of Mental Health. And what we did is we collected data from a sample of 253 young men and social men here in New York City. We collected GPS data, survey data, and Twitter data. Not their Twitter data, but Twitter data from New York City to quantify neighborhood level racism and neighborhood level homophobia. So this is a map, thank you Rumi for creating it, um, that shows hot spots and cold spots of neighborhood level racism and homophobia. And essentially the red are places where there's higher amounts of racism and homophobia when we account for the actual distribution of people who tweet. And this is also the percent of, of racist and homophobic tweets where we put into zip codes. So now the second half of the book, we in some ways um, disbanding or, or don't focus in much on methods, but we actually try to link neighborhoods to a wide variety of health outcomes, two of which I'll highlight today. One of which is the built environment, led by a close colleague of mine, Gina uh, Lavasi from Drexel University. So the built environment, just to say again, includes access to the attractiveness of walkable destinations, as well as community design features, sites such as sidewalk access. It's been associated with a wide range of health outcomes, from motorcycle, uh, uh, from uh, 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 pedestrian uh, collisions, physical activity, hypertension, etc. I want to present one paper conducted by a colleague of mine in Paris um, titled Walk Score and Cardiometabolic Disease in the French Record Study. So we wanted to look at whether walk score, which is a measure of walkability, including using crowdsourced methods, whether that could be associated with cardiometabolic outcomes, obesity, hypertension, and heart rate. So we had my college record study, which I briefly discussed earlier, which had over uh, almost 6,000 participants, and to it we added walk score data. Interestingly, we found that had living in a neighborhood with more walkability, as defined by walk score, those people had decreased BMI, that means they were less likely to be obese, they had decreased waist circumference, they had increased recreational walking, and they had decreased systolic and diastolic blood pressure, as well as decreased resting heart rate. So now I'm going to switch over to the social environment. There's a wide range of social environment characteristics that one can study in neighbors and health work, such as neighborhood norms. Dr. Palomar and I have written some papers about neighborhood norms, neighbor disorder, neighbor safety, as well as neighbor stigma. And the social environment has been related to a wide range of health outcomes, including diet, obesity, mental health. I'm going to focus on spatial stigma, which is a chapter led by Donna King from Yale, because uh, perhaps hot novel feature that one can study. My group, thankfully, is one of the first groups to study spatial stigma quantitatively in a paper titled Spatial Stigma, Body Mass Index and Blood Pressure, a global positioning system study among low-income housing residents in New York City. So this idea of spatial stigma really came from sociologists, um, especially born out of this theory called broken windows. And essentially, broken windows is speaks to physical disorder that we have in neighborhoods. And essentially, these early researchers linked, literally, broken windows to a wide range of health outcomes and health behaviors. One provocative paper that they published was they found that broken windows, and literally broken windows, were associated with increased rates of gonorrhea. So, sp <laughs> <laughs> so spatial stigma is uh, the negative representation of place that's attached to social context or neighborhoods. So I'm from Washington, D.C., and one uh, stigmatized neighborhood is Anacostia. So imagine a neighborhood here or anywhere where you say that neighborhood name and people kind of cringe or they make a face or they look at you funny. That would be an example of spatial stigma. And just a kind of silly but salient and perhaps interesting uh, uh, example in popular culture is the song uh, Loyals by, by, Ro by uh, Lord, um, where she talks about not being proud of her address and having postcode envy. So we wanted to assess whether spatial stigma was associated with impaired cardiovascular health. And we developed this questionnaire 
uh, four item questionnaire, with the first questionnaire uh, item being overall, what is the reputation of your neighborhood? Good, moderate, bad, or unknown. And again, in this study, we measured, my medical students measured uh, participants' uh, body weight uh, and blood pressure. Perhaps most interestingly, we found that reporting that you live in a neighborhood with bad neighborhood reputation and we control for a wide variety of characteristics to demonstrate that its association is real, i.e. that it's not spurious, living in a neighborhood with bad neighborhood reputation was associated with a higher BMI, increase in systolic as well as diastolic blood pressure, and increase of, uh, increased likelihood of overweight and hypertension. So, studying neighborhoods in health is actually really complicated, and in the chapters we talk about the complexity and nuances in that. So a lot of times people study one particular neighbor characteristic and one particular health outcome, but you can imagine that's actually not how things exist. So in neighborhoods that are spatially uh, stigmatized, may not have, uh, have, have, may have poor built environments and lack of food stores, and uh, we talk about some methods and models where we're beginning to appreciate that complexity. So in the book, in the first chapter in particular, Churro and I talk about these five trends that we see in neighbors in health research. I will go over all here, but you can read the chapter and or uh, can send you the slides. But I'll talk about two that particularly uh, stick out to me and the two that my group especially is focused on. One is that there's this growing specificity in examining neighborhood effects. So we see this growing, uh, this increased specificity in both the exposure side, so characterizing, not characterizing neighbor exposures really well, and on the outcome side. So for example, using objective measures of, of health outcomes. And finally, researchers are really advocating for uh, the uh, complexity uh, in their models. And there's a chapter on agent-based modeling by um, uh, Abdul El Sayed, who's actually running for the governorship of Michigan, and Sandra Galea, who's dean of BU School of Public Health. So I want to talk about this a little bit in just a, a brief second of some of our work. We've been doing neighborhoods and health work around the world. We've talked about some studies we've done in Paris. We have a, a project in Abu Dhabi right now where we're collecting survey data on neighborhoods and uh, diabetes outcomes. But I'll talk about one local example of the, probably the biggest study that our group is currently working on. Right now we're collecting data from a sample of uh, 350 black men and with men in Chicago. And we're looking at how the neighbors <coughs> are in and the social networks they're embedded in relate to PrEP uptake and adherence. <coughs> PrEP, as you may know, is a pill that one could take to prevent HIV. And our hypothesis is that if you live in neighborhoods that have increased access to PrEP, uh, PrEP, as well as uh, providers who support you taking PrEP, and you have social networks that uh, uh, encourage PrEP uptake adherence, then you're more likely to study, you're more likely to uptake PrEP. And the thing is that we don't actually know why people take PrEP beyond individual level reasons. So this is important. So the book argues, and my work and many others argue that neighbors matter and you need to invest in neighborhoods. But why does this matter in the first place? So it matters because it really highlights and talks about the importance of targeting resources and just generally improving neighborhoods. So increasing uh, economic development, for example, within neighborhoods. And one thing we're especially moving towards is not also structural changes of neighborhoods, but how can we embed or think about behavioral models of prevention with thinking about context. So for example, you can imagine that you can develop an application for smokers. When smokers are near a tobacco retailer, which may be this environmental cue to cause them to smoke, we give them prevention messages like smoking is bad for you kind of thing. Not as corny as that, but you know, something a little bit more exciting. So in the second edition of Neighbors in Health, we have uh, expanded the coverage of methods and models in spatial epidemiology. There are chapters on GPS, social media, online data, spatial autocorrelation, and agent-based models. And we cover a wide range of uh, of health outcomes that, uh, neighborhood features that can relate to health outcomes from the built environment that we talked about briefly, food environment, spatial stigma, uh, foreclosure and segregation. So I want to thank you for being here, but thank Acho Kawachi, my uh, uh, postdoctoral mentor and lifelong colleague from Harvard School of Public Health, Oxford University Press for being fabulous to work with for this first book, uh, and the authors who were fantastic leading researchers in the field. This is my contact information. Now we go to the session. That was really a great overview of the book. Thank you, Dustin. And you know, I, I, I thought I would just uh, frame a couple of my questions first.
before we, we open it to the, to the audience. With, again, the, the so what. Um, you know, what we're looking for in many respects is a modifiable uh, neighborhood characteristics that we can potentially test that, you know, if we improve or act upon these characteristics, health improves, right? So one is, can we identify what really is causally impacting health in a neighborhood? Yeah. Or is that, is that neighborhood characteristic really just a clue into something that is something else that we can impact that isn't necessarily a neighborhood characteristic, right? These yeah. clues are helpful and also these causal neighborhood characteristics. So I, I want to start with just the big question. You, you've been at this for a while. You have a lot of colleagues in this, in this uh, field, and you have just pulled together the latest science on na neighborhoods matter. If you had to say, you know, there was one neighborhood characteristic that you could change to have the biggest impact on health, where would you point people? Um, but in, in seriousness, I think that we really don't know what the most salient neighborhood characteristic is. But I'll kind of flip the question on Ted and by saying that I think that we need to, we didn't talk about this in the book enough now, but I think about it, the importance of social characteristics or social features in neighborhoods. So some emerging work that I'm doing with the Churro is looking at social environments of neighborhoods, particularly social cohesion within neighborhoods, and how these things relate to a wide variety of health outcomes. Um, I'd say that in terms of the science, we don't know what's the most salient thing, partially because, and we emphasize this in the book, but people have studied neighborhoods pretty bad. <laughs> and so now we're, we're, we're showing people and demonstrating that there are new methods that we can use to study neighborhoods. And hopefully that can illustrate or illuminate kind of your question, what are the salient features? I think we don't, we don't really know um, as of now. And if you were to tell us a little bit more about why the study of neighborhoods were, were, so, were so flawed. I won't use the word bad, but were so flawed, you know, the, the challenge. Um, one reason is because we weren't, we designed studies, or studies were being conducted that weren't designed to study neighborhoods. So we just kind of collected data from various sources. But you can imagine that when you collect data, or when you collect data with a particular research question in mind, you collect better data. And so that's one thing, and kind of more substantively, a lot of our work looks at this idea of spatial misclassification. So we're essentially we're arguing that it's this misestimation of a neighborhood feature. And essentially we're saying that you know, if you use certain neighborhood definitions like a zip code or a census tract, that may not be the most salient ways we define neighborhoods. And I kind of briefly highlight the importance of mobility data because we're, we're demonstrating empirically in many populations, uh, men, with men, transgender women, low-income people in New York, that people are highly spatially polygamous and that we need to think about that in the, the models or in this context, the neighborhood definition that we use. And so it, the early examples of neighborhood health research, they all use these administrative neighborhoods, which are boundaries which are quite large. So Eredismo in Paris, they're really big. And you can imagine that if you're on the periphery of that neighborhood, that neighborhood feature, that level of quantity may not be as salient to you as opposed to the, the, the attribute from the next neighborhood over. Right yeah, no, I know. I, I think you, it, you you say it well. Just cap, getting better definitions, better 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 characterizations, better measurement of what truly a neighborhood is, is a challenge. Um, and and a lot of your current work speaks to to ways that we're we're, we're getting into what are potentially real neighborhoods for people. There's this other conundrum about. Uh, Composition versus context. So when we talk about composition versus context, this is you know who lives in what neighborhood, who self-selects into living in a neighborhood versus the neighborhood itself, and teasing out the difference between people who have self-selected in there into a community versus the the risk that that community might inherently uh, impose on upon someone is challenging, and I think this is why there is. Uh, uh, for a long time, the research was focused on trying to tease those two things apart. But now the, the focus on more complex approaches, I think, takes a different approach. And can you tell us yeah. 
why are we thinking about complex approaches like dynamic systems modeling or agent-based modeling or, or you know. Sorry, so the current research on neighborhood and health, from my perspective in churros, is that it's very static and doesn't appreciate complexity at all. So for example, in a very crude example, when people have looked at the built environment in obesity, which is a commonly studied feature, people don't take into account the food environment, or they don't take into account other neighborhood features that exist, but that's not reality. And so these other models explicitly kind of turn that simplistic notion on its head. And they appreciate that there are many different actors, uh, including at the neighborhood level. Um, and so that the models that are estimated are more close to reality than not. And to Dr. Thorpe's point about um, residential selection, so in neighbors and health research, we have this strong issue that we kind of don't acknowledge enough, which is that people don't, aren't, aren't randomly placed into neighborhoods. We actually choose to live in certain neighborhoods. And so right now, we are in all of my grants in the current and moving forward, we're collecting rich data or trying to collect rich data on uh, reasons for people, re reasons why people live in certain neighborhoods. So neighborhood preferences. So for example, you can imagine that you know, we find this association between uh, 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 neighborhood parks and jogging. But it's not that this exogenous feature of neighborhood parks may actually matter to jogging. It's that I may be a jogger. <laughs> I'm actually not. Jogging. But I may be a jogger, and jogging may actually, me being a jogger may, may be the reason why I chose to live in this neighborhood, you know, that has a, a park. I'm going to pause. I have many more questions, but any questions or, or, or thoughts, observations from colleagues in the audience? Please. So, some of you may know me. I'm a librarian, so this is where this is coming from. <laughs> have you thought about a classification system for neighborhoods? Because I'm actually from Pittsburgh, and I've been in New York for over 30 years. So when I came to New York, and my brother was trying to help me find a place to live, you could literally cross the street and know that you're in a different neighborhood. So if you say five blocks, well, no, crossing the street, you're in a different neighborhood. Where I grew up in Pittsburgh, um, there, it was an L-shaped street, and that's where the black people lived. No sidewalks. And as time went on, they had to cut down the fence, and when you cross over the street, then you'd be in another neighborhood. So it's like, it's not so much space, but also boundaries. barriers. Boundaries, mm -hmm. right. Boundaries and Front barriers. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. So if you yeah. classify um, some of the neighborhoods that you showed up there, yeah. you know, then you can reach different, the different nuances you've talked about. So we discussed or conceptualized neighbors in the chapter that I wrote with um, uh, uh, Basil Shea, a colleague of mine from Harrison, and Sean uh, uh, Reagan, who's a geospatial analyst who works with me, um, thinking this to territorial approach, um, thinking, defining neighbors in kind of three uh, uh, generations. I forget the exact dates, but I think we said uh, administrative neighborhood definitions were predominant you know, before 2003, when the first edition was uh, written. Uh, current approaches were 2003 to when the publication is, so 2018. And the newer approaches are these kind of activities-based neighborhoods. But you can think about other ways to define neighborhoods that are not based on people's movement, but based on social demographic characteristics. Um, so Rumi Chinar is a professor of engineering here in the audience who's done some of that work, where we define neighborhood based on social features of neighborhoods. So in a recent paper that we have pending, that she sent an email about today, um, we define neighborhoods actually based on the level of, of racism and homophobia within them. Um, so so we, 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 could, we could flip it on its head and think about that as another way to define neighborhoods. But I see code one covers yeah. this, code two covers that. You know, That's great. Yeah. Ruby's kind of the leader of pushing that work the most. Um, but yeah, that's another classification system of neighborhoods for sure. Uh, Hi, thanks. Um, Hi, Dustin. Uh, I'm also from Pittsburgh, and I think people <laughs> I from know. Pittsburgh have really deep interests in neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's a very That's neighborhood yours. city. Um, <laughs> and I perpetrated a lot of that bad research that you were talking about 20 years ago. I so. didn't mean to do the word bad. No, 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 early no, seminal no, work. No, no. You, were, you were right that we were fitting questions to the data available instead of fitting data to the questions that need to be answered, and there were huge limits. So I'm thrilled to hear about these developments. Two questions. Uh, the first is, um, it doesn't sound like you give much explicit attention to the book, and maybe I'm wrong, in the book, and maybe I'm wrong about economic factors. They're entwined in everything. And the second is about 
development, uh, some people at younger and older ages of life aren't as spatially polygamous, or if they are, somebody else is playing around with them by moving them. Mm -hmm. And so, any thoughts about those traditions? Um, in the first chapter, we provide a history of neighbors and health work, including talking about the, talking about the early work that focuses on socioeconomic conditions in neighborhoods and health outcomes, and we demonstrate through the empirical literature that there's a large, robust, clear evidence that living in a bad neighborhood as defined by socioeconomic conditions or socioeconomic disadvantage is robustly bad for you um, in terms of mortality and a wide range of health conditions. Um, so we kind of talked about that there, and it was heavily emphasized in the first edition, so we decided to not focus on that particular aspect as much, um, because the science really hasn't changed. Living in a poor neighborhood is bad for you. Um, in terms of mobility by population, um, I have stage too. Yeah. So, I have a thought on that. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about lead in particular. So, the you know children and older adults, their 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 footprint, as you were suggesting, uh, their mobility footprint might be smaller, and uh, the time spent in certain areas is greater like in homes, etc., and they're low on the ground. And, it, it, you know, the, the interesting, the, um, you know, we learn that place, even at young ages, has lifelong enduring impacts. So we're learning still today about the impacts of childhood exposure on, to lead on adulthood, you know, mental uh, capacity, physical functioning, health outcomes, um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, decades later, and so place really does matter in, in in a big way, but in a different way. So I do think that there is a life course kind of perspective that is different depending on developmental stage, and that to me I think brings your point home even more. And I would say the the science of mobility, it's really new and emerging in terms of the evidence. Um, so I would say the last paper we published on mobility was a paper or a study led by an undergraduate student of mine who's now doing his PhD at Brown, where he, he wanted to do two things. He wanted to assess whether we can assess um, mobility vis-a-vis -vis GPS data among a sample of transgender women in New York City. And then two, kind of more substantively, we're interested in the spatial scope of our sample. So we, there's nothing known, literally, about transgender women's mobility. One could argue that they're spatially entrapped, i.e. that they don't travel a lot, given um, the fear of going to certain bathrooms, which actually is something that's come up in our qualitative work, or they could be quite spatially polygamous, um, given that they're highly unstably housed, which we see in our data too. Uh, in, in that paper, which is uh, in review right now, we find that in our sample, which is relatively small, this is a pilot study, that these sample of transgender women were highly spatially polygamous, whereby they experienced like almost every census tract in New York City. Um, but in terms of spatial polygamy among older adults, it's not something that I specialize in in particular, and I'm not sure about that. A colleague of mine, Jenna Hirsch, who's a professor at Drexel, is kind of leading the GPS mobility work among older populations. But my sense of her work, and the, the couple of reviews that I've done in her papers, is she's finding the same thing. Um, certainly the scale of spatial movement isn't as much as uh, uh, younger samples, but it's more than we anticipated. We have a question by our colleague here, and then Scott. So I'm going to keep the tradition going. It seems like the folks are asking questions. <laughs> questions Pittsburgh. Are, 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 no, not Pittsburgh, but they're you know, articulating where they're from. So um, two friends of mine, Larry and George, good to see you. I'm from Washington, D.C. But you lived in Pittsburgh. And I lived in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm from Washington, D.C. At Anacostia, the very community that you yeah. said is somewhat stigmatized. Um, I'm proud of it. Um, all that stuff. But anyway, I'm curious about, um, Dustin, all of the great kinds of uh, methods you laid out in terms of measuring uh, neighborhood impact. Um, and certainly, as you uh, suggested, there have been a lot of great advancements. Um, but I'm curious about um, a couple of questions, but I'm just going to ask one at this moment. Uh, I'll ask the other one offline. But um, the policy level because, you know, at some level, you know, there are overarching influences, and I think while you're sort of getting at this to some extent with the economic perspective, but, like, given these, you know, great uh, advances and methods in terms of measuring neighborhood 
impact you are, you know, suggesting that there's some association, yada, yada, yada. Um, what are the policy levers that need to be um, pushed? Yeah. So this is Michael Lindsay, who's professor of social work here at NYU. That's a really difficult question, honestly. One methodological <coughs> thing that, one methodological aspect that we think to study neighborhoods is uh, by using natural experiments. So there's a chapter written by Teresa Osipok, who's a professor at University of Minnesota in a grad school, a colleague of mine, where we demonstrate through uh, environmental uh, natural experiments, such as you know the implementation of a supermarket in a neighborhood, or um, uh, it's another example, um, mobility program. So Gatro was, was a residential mobility program, and that the effects of moving to certain neighborhoods or or having uh, this exogenous feature of you know supermarkets being built and how that relates to health. Um, that's one way that we think uh, about uh, that we can convince policymakers that certain neighborhood features matter. But in terms of what those neighborhood features are, which I think is the second part to your question, I honestly think we don't know. We, and we tried to demonstrate this in the book. But for example, the chapter on the food environment and health, led by Jason Block, who's a professor at Harvard Medical School, the evidence is all over the place. <laughs> I could present to you a study that one of my residents did who worked with me, a pediatrician colleague of mine, who demonstrates that you know supermarkets are good for you and, and fast food restaurants are bad for you. But the story's not so clear. And I can write other evidence where we find no associations or the antithesis. So I can kind of to Lori's Tell us tell us why there. you think that is. So okay, uh, the, one of the first papers we published was when I was a postdoc with Steve Bortmaker, where we found that Kids who lived, kids who lived in neighborhoods, I think it was fast food, had lower BMI or something like that, and we were kind of perplexed. The sample was already kids who were overweight, and so we hypothesized that you know supermarkets, while conceived to be good entities within neighborhoods, actually sell obesogenic foods or food that cause obesity. But we don't kind of think about that nuance enough. We we kind of make the story so clear in our head that you know supermarkets are ubiquitously good, but they're probably not. Um, the point really is that, and that's to say this in a repetitive fashion, but I, I honestly think, and we try, we allow the authors to fully to not paint a story for students. So, if I give a lecture to medical students, I try to I try to provide the story uh, in a simple way so they understand it or convince them that this can matter. But as we talk to academics, that the story is just not clear at all, and I, I think partly because the, the way we study it, it meaning neighborhoods has not been uh, advanced, it's been really crude, and the methods we use, like just regular regression, the just regression models, don't actually account for the dynamics that are actually happening. So it's not just that you know we have this exogenous neighborhood feature, but I interact with you, Lorna, and you may impact how I'm interacting with the neighborhood, and subsequently my health outcome. And so for example, the chapter we have on agent-based modeling, we not only demonstrate ways that you can implement uh, a, uh, the agents can be implemented within a scientific study, but we talk about the kind of importance of thinking about uh, more advanced methods that really aren't ubiquitously used, or at least not used enough. So it's kind of an advanced question in some ways, because I think we're probably, we're honestly, we don't know. Yeah, I, I actually want to second one thing that you said and then open it up again for questions, but I, I do think the, the challenge, the, the obvious challenge in, in this question about the food environment that people have really focused on is measuring it better, measuring it better, measuring it better. But it's so interesting that sometimes it's, you know, we're measuring it better, we're measuring it better, but maybe the question's wrong, right? Maybe it's not do people in these communities have access to healthy foods, but maybe what's the preponderance of access to unhealthy foods, you know, the, instead of a food desert, a food swamp. And so you're seeing some of this pivoting around in, in, the, in research, like we, we get ourselves into these paradigms of thinking so that we're not asking the right question. And the, the, co the confluence of you know, difficult to do data, uh, difficult to, to do research with you know, poor measurement and the wrong question leads us in the desert for a while. You know, the, the real, the, the, the um, intellectual desert, not the food desert. I mean, just before the question though, I think, Partly, we expect that these, providing the framework for what's known and the methods, new, old, and new slash emerging, and not necessarily emerging 
in the literature, broadly speaking, but emerging in neighbors and health work can help us think through the right questions. And so partly, uh, I think the last uh, 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 sentence or so of the first chapter that Chur and I wrote, we say that we really hope this is, that inspires and like, well, we really hope it inspires the next generation of work that can actually really answer these questions that we really don't know the answer to. Um, I, I've been focusing on this room, but I do want to get Scott, and then I'm going to come over to this side. So Scott Sherman, Department of Population Health. <coughs> and even though I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York City, I've been to Pittsburgh many times. <laughs> <laughs> so I went every two months. Um, I, so I think about uh, individual level factors like poverty, where in the same building you can have people who are uh, below the poverty line and well above it, versus neighborhood ones like your uh, neighborhood stigma, which would be more pervasive. Um, I'm used to intervening at individual level factors. So you answered this in part already with the previous part in terms of nutrition, which I think of as probably the, one of the easier neighborhood level things to change. But when I go into the supermarket and it's an affluent neighborhood, uh, they don't make money off the healthy stuff. They make money off the obesogenic stuff. And so that's what's near the soup, the cash register and stuff. So have people done studies with really making the neighborhood eating healthy rather than just simply having a supermarket there? Sort of designing for health rather than designing for profit. I'm familiar with, um, you know, there's a series of experiments that, that Tom Farley, who was our health commissioner here in New York City for a while, conducted back when he was in Louisiana. And they actually uh, performed some experiments in supermarkets where they rearranged, you know, what goes on the optimal se optimal shelf versus what goes on the suboptimal shelf in terms of what, what your eyes land on. Um, and I think, again, to, to do this on a wide scale to see population or neighborhood or community impacts is, is challenging. Uh, it hasn't been done a great deal. Uh, we need those exogenous shocks more uh, to be able to do that. Um, but on the individual level, there have been uh, associations of, you know, that that step-by-step -step question of, does it change what they buy? And if it changes what buy, they buy, does it change what they eat? If it changes what they eat, does it change their, you know, it's challenging to tease out that causal chain, but it's very important. There are some work. So Jason Block, who wrote the chapter on the food environment, he has a K in K-23 grant to look at changes within um, uh, cafeterias within the hospital settings. So more micro, not neighborhoods, but how we actually physically locate certain foods and how that relates to uh, 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 dietary outcomes. And at the neighborhood level, in terms of built environment, there's a lot of work done, including by a colleague of mine, uh, Mary M. Pitts from the University of Southern California, where they actually use smart design principles. So, I don't remember all the smart design principles, but um, basically healthy built environment stuff, like having walkable destinations kind of thing. And they designed these neighborhoods with these principles, and they've looked at the effect of designing these healthy neighborhoods on a wide range of health outcomes. And essentially, they found that, you know, that designing these healthy neighborhoods are, is associated with better health outcomes walking, reductions in um, obesity. But the, the, the challenge that I kind of want to implore us to think about is that, you know, they design these neighborhoods with these built environment principles, but they also tend to be safer neighborhoods. They tend to be neighborhoods that are less stigmatized, et cetera. And so we frame it in this kind of simplistic way that, you know, it's this built environment, but in fact, it's more complicated than that. Um, but, but, but yes, there are studies that are currently being done. And the, the chapter by uh, uh, Teresa Hussle-Cook, um, who I would say is a leader, in uh, natural experiments, including as it relates to neighbors and health, um, really kind of highlights the emerging work that's been done where we're actually uh, uh, changing features of neighborhoods and looking at the impact on a wide range of health and economic and behavioral education walk. Um, you also, I'm, I'm from New York. I've never been to Pittsburgh or Washington, D.C. <laughs> I'll eventually get there. Um, you would mentioned the state of neighborhoods, but in New York, in the uh, the dramatic change that's happened in the last 10 years is astounding. Those, um, let's say just take 10, 15 years ago, if someone mentioned came from Big Five, from Harlem, or from Williamsburg, or uh, from certain other neighborhoods, that would be, you know, a bit of the negative. Now it's almost, uh, it's not so much a bad word. Now you're in an up and coming neighborhood when 10, 15 years ago it was completely different. And the ironic part about it, there are clusters of neighborhoods that may only exist in name only simply because they seem one of the same. I live in Williamsburg. 
So I talk about Williamsburg as well. It's almost the same as Greenpoint. It's, it's, it's practically the same because of the economic movement of, of, of people who can't afford Williamsburg went to Greenpoint. Greenpoint became expensive. Then they went to Bushwick. So now you have mega neighborhoods that don't really necessarily have a specific name. So I don't know how you approach that in your studies. And I'm just speaking from a New York specific perspective. I don't know to what extent that's happening in other um, U.S. cities. Yeah. Um, okay. To step back. Um, in the book, we talk about traditional built environment, traditional neighbor characteristics that people study, things like built environment, which has been studied to death, um, a lot of studies, um, to the food environment. And so then we look at kind of newer neighborhood features that are emerging in terms of the science of neighborhood study. So we have a chapter written on neighborhood foreclosure by Mariana Arcade, who's a professor at MIT and grad school friend and colleague of mine, as well as a chapter on neighborhood stigma um, and health. So I presented my study for lots of reasons, but my study was the first quantitative study, to my knowledge, to link neighborhood stigma and to any health outcome. Don Nakeen, who wrote the chapter, who's really the expert on neighborhood stigma, um, has conducted Prior to this, a series of qualitative studies where she demonstrates that you know living in a stigmatized neighborhood or being from a stigmatized neighborhood is associated with impaired health across the, the, the board. Um, you're highlighting a point that that important. Uh, about a week ago, I think I served on a as a moderator on a panel from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and it was all about gentrification and health. And it was kind of funny because I don't really study gentrification, um, but you know the book in neighborhoods, so they asked me to serve on this. But in this book, we didn't talk about gentrification at all, which is a missed opportunity in some ways, but partially, but partially it speaks to, <laughs> partially it's, it speaks to the state of the science. There's just a, a smattering of studies, and our, Lauren and I are conducting some of those studies ongoing, that are actually quantitatively, they're studying, including via qualitative means, how neighborhood uh, gentrification, especially neighborhood uh, displacement, relates to health. And, I'm not an expert on that per se, but it's just an emerging kind of a literature on that. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'd say more soon. I'd love to tag on to it because I think part of you know this, this movement that you described, these mega neighborhoods now, it also raises this other issue around housing affordability. And so we, we, we used to think about um, built environment and housing often through a lens of housing quality and our concerns about the impacts of housing quality on health. but. One of the, the hallmark features of the last few decades in this country has been the soaring inaffordability of housing and what that's doing to people's physical environment, social environment, um, economic uh, well-being. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, place a characteristic uh, that has very, very in, uh, big impact on people's physical and mental health, um, but it's not a neighborhood. Well, it, it, it's associated with neighborhoods. So I think, I, I think the issues of, of, and the phenomenal book, if you haven't read it, is Eviction, um, phenomenal book that came out just last year by uh, Matthew Desmond, um, oh, yes. uh, really captures some, some of the, the sure. impacts of, of um, sure. this affordable housing crisis. Over here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I have not been an expert. So I'm asking this um, mostly like just a curiosity. Um, I've been appointed to be on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Create NYC Cultural Plan, which is asking a lot of these same kind of neighborhood questions, but with like culture as an asset, which is so. I guess I'm curious. It's almost an ethical question. Like, um, what happens when this data? gets used to change a neighborhood, but not the people. Meaning that um, you, you, know, you create the high line, but then in the process, the people that, you know, that these things were designed to serve end up being, you know, um, and then that's how. Or you bring city bike to a neighborhood. Right, and I think that's one of the, you know, and so I'm just curious if like in this field, there is a, a conversation of like what this data gets, like even the way that broken windows was used politically. Right. You know? I think there's different perspectives on the, what we bring to the research and, and how we execute the research in terms of beyond the publication. So grad school professor of ours really helped me think through the biases that I bring to the work and to have the work inform the community as much as possible, when possible. So I'll just give it a quick example. 
in the summer of 2014, for the reception, in the summer of 2014, we conducted the study, the New York City Low Income Housing Neighbors Health Study. All low income people, by definition, people, I think it was something like 85% were people who were in public housing, and we had certain, you know, a, a, a low income requirements. We conducted the study, then uh, I tend to be pretty gregarious, so people tend to, to tell me things about their neighborhoods that were hurtful to them, or their stressors. So for example, I remember a woman telling me she was raped in her neighborhood and how that made her feel. And so we essentially started to document, with people's permission of course, um, their stories. And now we show this kind of documentary to medical students and students to demonstrate beyond the literature, you know, these p-values and odds ratios, et cetera, that neighbors matter and these are kind of the voices of people. But what we also did, which I think is to your point, um, Kenneth, is that we held this community forum. So God, it was, I don't remember when that was, I think it was fall 2014. I basically invited all the participants back in the study, including people from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, a series of academics who were friends and colleagues, um, as, and again, the participants in the study, and uh, various, um, I forget the titles now, but people who were the board members for the different public housing developments, and I shared with them, uh, community board members, I, I shared with them the findings of our research. Um, so it's kind of one, way I wanted to kind of give back in that way. And in fact, people asked us, you know, what are you doing with our data? And increasingly now, actually, uh, I just came back from a conference in Mexico where uh, it, these gay men that people are sampling are asking, okay, you're getting all this data from me, but what are you doing with it? And so our group increasingly is trying to tackle that. And I would say the first example is probably the, the best that we have done, but I think that researchers have very different perspectives and different demands at the time, so, and priorities, and, what's important to them. So I would say a lot of, I'm not so, so sure it's the norm to recontact participants and share with them their data, um, and implying that it's not. But um, one thing we've also been doing or in, in our project moving forward is, uh, particularly in our core studies, so where we follow people over time, is giving people newsletters. We're not trying to, it's, it's a delicate situation because we're not trying to change their behaviors, but we could be able to study them in a natural setting. But we're also kind of sharing to them, you know, this percentage of people smoke, this percentage of people do, as, a, as a way to kind of share to them how they're contributing to science in a, in a real way. Yeah, maybe, you know, I think you're hitting on a really timely topic because I, I think we've worked in, in, the, in several fields, including public health. Uh, the concept of community-based participatory research is it's pretty well established that's basically beginning your research with community partners at the table, framing the research questions together in a way that matters and, and the, the community members have ownership and then they have ownership of what happens as a result of the research uh, and the implications in terms of programmatic work or policy work. That's, that's fairly well established and that's, that's a type of research that many people do engage in um, and I think does potentially give some agency to the community around what's happening. But more and more, there's also this question of um, uh, how to empower communities to do this themselves and, and how to empower communities to, 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 to use data for themselves. And also what we're collecting and, and, and who, you know, the information coming from cell phones to be able to track, you know, where people live and work gives us great data, but these are data that weren't collected with an express purpose for, for researchers to use, but we're using them. So now this gets us into the world of Cambridge Analytica and you know, how, what's responsible data use and how do we inform communities when, when we're using their data. And it's a very timely issue that is, I think, you know, one that will bring us, in a, if, we're, if we you know, are optimistic, it will bring us closer to empowering communities to own their future better. If we're pessimistic, you know, uh, we might see this as a fraught, difficult, you know, intransient problem. That was a great question. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a couple, one or two last questions, please. I just wanted to follow on a little bit on the gentrification question. I think it, it, because it's so, that's so important in New York, it's also important to uh, to not just focus on that because there's a lot of displacement happening around the country that isn't really isn't related to incoming wealth into neighborhoods and so and, and I wonder if, if there's some interesting 
research to be done around the speed at which stigmas change and how how quickly these things can be predictive. Like I think of a you know a suburban neighborhood where they see a ton of foreclosures after the 2008 crisis. But that that nature of that place, the stigma, if you will, changes rapidly. How quickly is that predictive of health outcomes? And I also, I'm, I'm an architect, so feel free to laugh at me about the suggestion, but does gentrification, uh, despite all of its many, many problems, present the potential for a control experiment where if you could identify folks that, you know, are, you know, extremely poor but have remained in the neighborhood and the characteristics of that neighborhood that have changed because of gentrification have been removed and so the stigma is no longer there, you could see if their health outcomes have changed at all related to the removal of those characteristics. I'm just sort of fascinating. Those are hard questions. Um, the first is the rate of change in terms of stigma in neighborhoods. To my knowledge, it's only been a smattering, very few number of studies, and it's a real answer. Uh, looking at spatial stigma uh, as it relates to health or, or, or generally. And so one reason why Chiro and I, mainly me, why I pushed so hard to have that chapter in the book was because we thought it, it could be potentially selling it, and we don't really know. Um, so I think, I, I know, Daniel Keene, again, from Yale, is really the expert on that, but I'm going to say literally there's like five or six studies, maybe, on neighbor stigma, which is one reason why my group um, began investigating it, because I thought it was really important, or potentially important, particularly for certain populations. Um, I'm that is first. I'm becoming versed in the gentrification work through the, through the, the collaborative work that Lynn and I are doing with other colleagues. So I'm not as versed in terms of the existing literature on gentrification, but I, I, I know that there is a small literature in burgeoning. Um, I don't. I think, t to my knowledge right now, all the studies that have been conducted are observational studies. I don't think that there's, any, and I can safely, I feel comfortable saying that there's probably been no empir uh, um, uh, study that relied on using any cause, cause experimental design um, to study the effect of gentrification on health. Um, you're right. You just said research. You just said research. Okay. So yeah, you're involved in one too. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yes, those studies can and probably should be conducted. I think that now we're we're in neighborhoods of health work, and this could be a good frame for the end before the reception. Is now that we're we're piercing or or narrowing in on more specific characteristics, including characteristics that are, are more timely and, and salient. And I think that in the next probably five to 10 years, the gentrification work is gonna substantially increase because gentrification is happening, whether we want it to or not, around the country, including the part that I think that we are probably most interested in are what's happening to the people who are displaced. Um, and, uh, Can I take moderator's prerogative and ask you one last question? Sure. Um, just, you, you work on, on uh, many things and, and on many fronts, and we've heard about a lot of your research today. Tell us what you're most excited about that you're beginning to work on or working on now. Give us a, a taste. Great question. The last curtain? Um, okay, hold on. Uh, could be that. Um, two things. Um, I have a book that we're writing right now the second book, it's called The Social Epidemiology of Sleep. Um, it's coming out next year. I'm working with Chiro uh, Kawachi and Susan Redline on that book. Um, I think sleep as a health outcome is particularly salient and important. And I think that we don't study sleep enough. So in the second book, we are, we are up for at the University of the Press. We are heavily do documenting why sleep is important, not just from a kind of physiological uh, 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 sleep medicine perspective, which has been shown through other books, where we're talking about socially how social certain social groups, for example, low income individuals and minorities, are less likely or more likely to have poor sleep health. Mm -hmm. So I would say the sleep work that my group is doing is especially interesting to me. And we have done a lot of work with uh, MSM or Medicine with Men, which is important and interesting, but we are really now thinking about the population that's most hit by uh, STIs, um, and that population is transgender women particularly transgender women of color. So we have a, have a series of R1s in review, hopefully they get funded, but that focus on exclusively transgender women, and particularly transgender women of color, um, based on the epidemiological evidence of who's hit, in this case, by HIV. So um, that's that, those two kind of silos of our work are the, the most interesting to me. Um, Great. So glad I asked.
And those are also things that we know very little work about neighborhoods and, and health among transgender women, for example. Last summer, when my students are here, we, wrote, we did a qualitative study uh, on uh, 40 transgender and gender non-conforming men and women, and we found these tantalizing results where neighbors were so salient. So for example, this one trans woman talked about um, her uh, moving in her neighborhood based on where she felt comfortable using the bathroom. And she talked about how that really kind of like stressed her out to think about. And now there are actually apps that we're learning about that are actually apps for trans people, for them to know like bathrooms that are safe, you know, gender, uh, for all genders kind of thing. Um, so I think that work like, is so timely, but it's so silly. And the most fascinating part to me is that we almost know nothing about it. Right, right. Fantastic. Well, that, we'll have you back here yeah. to tell us more about it. And thank you so much. Thank you, Rex, for coming.